Good evening and welcome to the Virginia African American Cultural Center Masterpiece Series. The artist that we are profiling, this is the second in a series of six. We're so excited to bring you talented artists who are going to tell us the behind the scenes of their success. We're so excited today and this evening to introduce you to nationally acclaimed artist Renee Dickerson. Renee is um, a very, very talented and gifted artist who works on canvas uh, with acrylics, and he is in private collections of um, nationally people um, like Bill Cosby, uh, Barry Gordy, Oprah Winfrey, and The Temptations. So we welcome Renee to our broadcast today. Welcome, Renee. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We are, we are so excited to have you this evening. Um, in, the, in the beginning, we talked about um, your art and your collectors and your success, but I think our viewers want to know a little bit behind the scenes of how does one start from the beginning and become successful? So let's start with the first question. Do you remember when you picked up your fir first paintbrush? Well, you know, I, I'll tell you, I like to tell this little story. I'm, I'm a 50s baby. I was born in the 51. And back in those days, the parents, uh, the fathers especially, used to pace in the waiting room uh, and uh, waiting to hear what the... <clears throat> Uh, child, if, if it's a girl or a boy. And of course, they would pass out the cigars and stuff. So I like to tell the story that when uh, my father was pacing and, the, uh, you know, the doctor got ready to smack me. Well, I came out of the womb with a brush and then he got ready to smack me and I flicked him in the eye with a uh, paint. And I've been painting ever since. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. But no, really, uh, I didn't pick up a brush uh, until probably, I guess, after I got out of the military. Uh, and that was in 1975, I started painting. I took a little acrylic painting class. And it was, uh, it was in 1975 that I started painting. So when you started to paint, did you see a vision and then you paint it? Or did you just start putting the brush on the canvas and something happened. Well, you know, uh, acrylic paint is uh, a difficult process because the paint dries so fast. And uh, I started kind of a, a, a glazing type of uh, technique. However, as time went by, I experimented. I just experimented with uh, various techniques. And then I started blending the colors uh, from the tube, and I started getting some really good results and uh, just started having fun with it. And that's what I try to encourage uh, even the young ones when I share my art with them, just to experiment, have fun, and grow as you do that. Do you remember when you first got reactions from people? What did they say about your work? Do you remember? Well, you know, just drawing, uh, when I was in grade school, I had friends, I was always doodling. Uh, and so my friends would have me to draw some of their projects for them. But I remember, I, I imagine um, I was in high school in 1968. When I was in high school, I was a sign painter. I was painting signs and I was designing logos for businesses in uh, Oakland, California, and I got really good responses from the people. I, I always felt that my work was my signature. And uh, in painting signs, I started developing the art. I was always making art, but that was a way to, to make money. That was a way that uh, people were commissioning me to paint their signs and doing uh, logo designs and that sort of thing. So it was an art form in itself. And that helped me to develop as uh, a painter. 
I'd like to ask um, our producer, Seiko, do you have some pictures that we can show um, so Renee can walk us through some of his paintings and his artwork? Renee, let's just start looking at some of your artwork and, and have you comment on it. I can tell you as I look through your, um, your portfolio or your catalog, um, I can tell you I was spellbound and captivated and just watching um, this vision come out and, and just realizing that this is truly gifted. So can you talk, let's just look at the one that's up now. Can you talk us through where did the vision come from? Well, yeah, uh, Barry's vision, um, oh, this was a labor of love. Um, <laughs> Of course, Motown was the backdrop of uh, many of our lives uh, just growing up. And I remember the first time I heard uh, a Motown song, it, it was Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Shop Around, uh, You Really Got a Hold on Me, Mickey's Monkey, all of those. I was in an art class and uh, uh, I was invited to be in a group, uh, a singing group. And of course, I wanted to be a part of that. And then I heard the temptations, the way you do the things you do. In fact, uh, it was the way you do the things you do, uh, the girls all right with me, all of those Motown, those early Motown songs and playing on my little uh, phonograph and uh, those 45s and those LPs. And I always wanted to be a part of Barry Gordy's uh, company. I had visions of running away from Oakland, California to Detroit to be a part of that. However, the Vietnam War came along and I uh, got drafted. I spent five years in the army, but I was an illustrator or in an artist in the army. However, after I got out of the army, tried to get the group back together and that didn't happen, but I knew that I wanted to record this story. This is a never to be repeated story. And so uh, the name of the painting is Barry's Vision. And it's the early days of Motown. It depicts uh, from the Marvelettes uh, in the upper left-hand corner to the Jackson Five. All of these artists were uh, artists that Barry Gordy uh, personally groomed himself. And of course, the my favorite out of all of them, of course, is The Temptations. And I have a long history, well, a long history since uh, 1992. I've had a a history with uh, The Temptation, especially Otis Williams, who is a very dear friend of mine. And, uh, uh, but it was the recording of this particular story. I wanted to capture the essence of the early days of Motown. And I've been associated with the museum in Detroit, uh, Barry Gordy, Otis, uh, Smokey, uh, many of the Motown uh, personnel. I've, have a, a long standing relationship with. I know I saw a video earlier of um, the Temptations founder, Otis Williams, um, giving a video tour of his home and he highlighted um, some of your art. Seiko, do we have that? Hello, welcome to my house. This is, as I refer to, the summit. You may come on in. I'm very hands-on when it comes to my home. I don't like clutter, I like space. Colors make your house bounce. This picture here, that's a wonderful painting from a friend of mine named Renee Dickerson. He's a noted black artist. That's Eddie, David, myself, Melvin, and Paul. You can see, I have been surrounded by some very talented brothers that could sing that. This is Shelly Berger, my manager. He's been with me since 1966. This is the famous four-headed mic. When the four-headed mic would come out, the place would erupt. So that's the tea and the temptation. It is now at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I gave it to them in 1990. This is my girl. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. There's the sun, birds in the trees. Renee, you a bad man. Well, I'm gonna say it's been wonderful having you all here. And you know what I'm about to say, get out of my house. So you know everybody that knows me, I always say, see ya later, gone.
That is really awesome to get um, national and international accolades and you've made friendships. Um, I have another question to ask you, but I do want to let our audience know that uh, Renee is ready to take your questions. Um, if you'd like to leave a question in your comment box and we will um, show some of your questions and Renee will answer them in real time. Um, I wanted to take this time also to let the audience know that Renee is working on an original art piece and we are going to have an auction have an for auction. the rest of the month. Um, so you will have an opportunity to own an original artwork by Renee Dickerson. And he is actually going to later in this um, program, show us his technique, take us behind the scenes to see how genius is made. So that is so exciting. And yes, he is ready to take your questions if you have any, uh, but I do have a couple more questions. Um, Renee, when I see your work, and again, I mentioned, I think that's um, gifted and that's ingenious, but what percentage of that is gift and what are the other things that need to happen to be successful? Well, I think that um, I am just grateful uh, to be able to, you know, it, it's not even a, a job. It's not even work. It's a, a labor of love. And I'm just grateful uh, that I have this ability. Uh, it's something that I've worked at. I think that it's very important that whatever we do, first of all, we want to believe in ourselves, uh, believe that we have something to offer. Uh, and I've never allowed negative uh, reactions to my work or even negative comments. I, I remember uh, growing up, people dear to me, they would tell me, well, Renee, you need to get a real job. For me, that was negative motivation. It just motivated me to go on because I felt that I had something to offer. But it's very important that we uh, know that we have something to offer, but that we can get better. Um, we don't have to be number one at what we do. But if we do our best, then the rest will take care of itself. And so I've been able to see that uh, as I have uh, experimented and worked on uh, this, uh, the work that I do, that I've been able to grow. Uh, I've seen over the years. I remember when I first started, I used to tear up pieces that I didn't want people to see. And then my wife told me, you need to stop doing that. And then I have collectors who want to see things that I didn't want, but I always wanted to improve. And the sky is the limit and my work is my signature. I hope that answered the, the question. Yes, uh, another question I have is, um, have you, once you realized that art was your passion, how much formal training did you get? Well, I'll tell you, um, I took a, a, an acrylic painting class uh, to learn the technique of acrylic painting, because once again, acrylic paints, well, they dry really quick. Uh, before painting with acrylics, I, I worked in uh, pastels, dry pastels, mm -hmm. and then I started working in oil pastels. Um, but what I found, I wanted to explore color. I like a lot of color, and you'll see that in my works. But um, I found that uh, experimenting, really working hard at it. And um, I remember after I got out of the military, I took this acrylic painting class. I'll never forget it. It was a little Jewish lady, Susan Yeiser. I'll never forget her. And she taught me a glazing technique. And then I just started experimenting with the acrylic paints. And now mm -hmm. I work directly out of the tube. I mix my colors. And I've uh, developed uh, a technique. I, I like to say it was in 2014, and I always sold my work, but in 2014, 
I found my voice as an artist, the technique and the style that I'm painting in. In this style, I can uh, cover any subject, any subject uh, that I desire and still come out with this particular style. And it's fun. Great. Well, we have a question from our audience. Kevin Jones is asking, do you teach any classes? Well, I'd love to be able to teach class. I am so busy. I've been um, I've been asked to teach and I just don't have the time. I mean, it's uh, my schedule is I mean, it's it's full on a regular basis and it's even getting uh more busy now because of uh, what I'm involved in. I'm presently painting for five galleries uh, and all of them are demanding time. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's really exhausting uh, to try to keep up with the demand. So at this time, I'm not uh, teaching class, but I do have a lot of advice uh, for aspiring artists uh, to continue to experiment Mm -hmm. uh, try all types of techniques, all types of art forms, and uh, believe in yourself. And uh, I think that you can be successful. When did you realize that you were a good artist and this can actually be your livelihood, that you can make a living from your passion? Well, um, you know, it, it, it's really interesting. I think it was uh, probably... Probably in the uh, mid seventies, I was approached. I, I remember uh, as a child, I used to go to our um, county fair, and I would always go go to the art uh, section, uh, the exhibit there, and I always wondered how could I exhibit in this. Well, I, I after I got out of the military, I went to the art exhibit. And I inquired and I found out that I could uh, have some of my artwork displayed. And so I exhibited some work there. Well, there was this uh, one white guy who fell in love with my work and he started collecting my work. Uh, he was, uh, it's it, the proverbial uh, patron of the arts. He liked my work so much, he gave me 12 thousand dollars and he wanted six paintings two thousand apiece and he told me just go paint and take my time now this was back in uh, the middle 70s and this is when everyone else was telling me to get a real job and here was a man total stranger he saw what i was doing he believed in me and then he started collecting my work in mass i mean he his office, it turned out he was a multimillionaire. And he kind of set me in a, in a direction. And then I started painting around uh, Oakland for a lot of different, I got a lot of different commissions from different ones. And that, I guess that was the beginning of it to where I really saw that I could make money. And, and then there was this one uh, incident I remember Dana Stubblefield, who played for the San Francisco 49ers. He heard that I was an artist. He wanted to buy some work. He bought six paintings, well, five paintings from me. And uh, the man spent $30,000. And I was I was shocked. And, and I, I found him through uh, some interior decorators who were decorating his home. That's when I knew that uh, after he spent that kind of money, that there were people buying art. And so I just started pursuing it. And the sky is the limit in this and, and just having a great time with it. Wonderful. Seiko, do you have another piece of art that you can share? And while you get that ready, there's another question from Brianna Gaines, who says, um, Mr. Dickerson, it's an honor to be with you. What is your favorite location to create? Where? Well, I do have a, a studio, a, a little small studio in my home. So, um, you know, I just get out of bed and uh, walk in another room and 
there I am at, at home. And I've always worked uh, at home. I've always, uh, even before I moved here to Virginia, I've been living in Virginia now for 20 years, but I always had a studio or a space in my home. Sometimes it was the living room. At, at, at one time it was the kitchen. I was, when I first started, and I used the back of a chair as my easel, but I felt that I wanted to do this work and I was always producing. And it's very important to me to start and finish work. So uh, for the most part, I like working uh, in my, my little studio and having that time to myself. Nice. We're going to put up another piece of art. And I have another question that I've been wondering, because you mentioned that you go into your room from your house and you paint and um, artists, in my opinion, and my thoughts are always by themselves. Do you ever feel any pressure or competition amongst other artists? No, I don't. Um, in fact, um, it is kind of a, a solitary type of uh, profession. In fact, I go into this world uh, and it's an opportunity to not only create, but I'll spend a lot of time just uh, looking at the work, noting, wondering what's my next move. And I find myself uh, oftentimes working on four or five paintings at a time as problem solving. So what I find is what I bring to the table, I try to make it unique. And so I don't feel that I have to compete or I'm not pressured by other artists, uh, other individuals, because I think that when you bring something unique and you're doing your best, you don't have to compete with others. You know, it's not a competition. It's, um, but it is knowing that you can get better at what you're doing. We just, while you were speaking, we saw a painting. Can we see that painting again? And is this an inspiration from your relationship or friendship with the Temptations? And can you talk more about your friendship with um, the Temptations and Otis Williams? And I know you've done some, not only private collections for them, but you've also done some um, albums. Can you talk about that while we look at this beautiful, stunning picture? Well, this picture, uh, this, this particular painting, um, their signature song, their anthem, they called it, My Girl. And um, for their 50th anniversary, they were uh, going to be in Virginia. They were, they were uh, working at Wolf Trap with the Four Tops. And so I was in a, a gallery in Leesburg, Virginia, a little small town in Virginia. And I wanted to do something really special. And so I got in contact with Otis and I wanted to take advantage of their being in town. And... Uh, so I created My Girl. And that particular painting, it tells the small story of My Girl. Sunshine on a cloudy day, cold outside, month of May. Um, and even uh, down in the left-hand corner, I have a silhouette of the Temptations. But when, I, when we unveiled this painting, we had the entire group in the gallery. We had about 300 people in the gallery. And we sang My Girl to the Temptations. Then we unveiled this piece. Now, oh, nice. This is very, yeah, this is a very important piece because right now with their musical, uh, we have plans uh, to produce a T-shirt a as well as a print that will be sold as merchandising at their, uh, their musical on Broadway, as well as in their various concerts and some of the other gift shops that are music related in various parts of the world. Great. Um, that is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. We do have questions from the audience. Audience, if you're listening and you want to leave a question, you can also please just leave them in the comments and Renee will answer them um, and live. And that is um, one other question I would like to ask before um, we're, we're going to auction a, an original piece from Renee. 
Um, it will be, we'll give you instructions on that. It, the auction is uh, going to be up all month. And also, um, we're able to take your questions live now, uh, but we do want to, um, we do want to talk more about um, the organization that is sponsoring this event, the Virginia African American Cultural Center. And we would like to introduce um, the members of that um, organization. Um, board member Chevette Jones is here today, and she is going to tell us more about um, the Virginia African American Cultural Center, and more importantly, let you all know how you can be involved. Good evening, Chevette. Good evening, Dee Dee and Renee. Thank you all so much. So far, this has certainly been a fascinating conversation. And thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening to hear from such a gifted and talented artist. We hope you had an opportunity to also join us last month to hear about the Mosaic Steel Orchestra from Dr. Anthony Haley. And we'll be able to join us next month for another evening featuring Don Pearson, a legend in the music industry. The Virginia African American Culture Center would like to continue bringing programs and programming suitable to all ages for your viewing pleasure. And we are only able to do this thanks in part to the generous support of our members, donors, sponsors, and those interested in ensuring that the Virginia African American Cultural Center will be a regional leader in generating historical and cultural content through programs, artistic performances, and curated exhibits. Our mission to collect, preserve, interpret Virginia's African American history, culture from the mid 1600s to present is what we are here for. And perhaps VACC's founder and chairman, Dr. Amelia Ross Hammond may have said it best when she said, it will be a place where local residents and tourists can learn about the richness and the diversity of the African-American experience relating to their lives historically, aesthetically, spiritually, and culturally. It will be the highlight of the contributions of African-Americans to the region and establish a tourism asset for Virginia Beach. So please consider becoming a member, a sponsor, or donor, or volunteer. Annual membership start at just $25 and more information about ways you can join VACC or support us can be found at VACCVB.org. And now here's a short video about the future of the Virginia African American Cultural Center. Seiko, are you ready for me? Coming soon to Hampton Roads, the Virginia African American Cultural Center will be a place that brings people together, celebrating African American history and culture, providing educational opportunities, fostering meaningful interaction, and bridging communities. Located in Virginia Beach, Virginia, at the intersection of Newtown Road and Diamond Springs Road, the Cultural Center is nested within some of the many culturally rich African-American communities of Princess Anne County. This prominent site along a well-traveled corridor is a visible beacon of innovation and celebration for the African-American community. The Cultural Center will tell the story of African-Americans in Virginia. Co. Ed. Q. The building's design is arranged according to this guiding formula. Co, meaning community, ed, meaning education, and Q, meaning culture. The site design is planned for two phases. Phase one, the community center, further named the drum, and phase two, the performance center. The site will okay. provide community gathering space, outdoor recreation space, and ample visitor parking. Here, in the recreation area, 
Restored basketball courts with new architectural landscaping features adjoined bridging connection to the drum. Resting atop the drum is the sacred circle, intended to serve as a green roof, allowing for outdoor learning and instruction. Taking a closer look at the project phasing, let's look at phase one. Beating as the pulse of the project, the drum will occupy phase one. The drum functions as the co-ed part of the formula. The drum's elliptical form offers a multifaceted facade to all sides. The sweeping serpentine sight walls serve as outreaching arms that both embrace the drum and welcome its neighbors. The sweeping sight walls also help create a gently rising hill, allowing for multifunctioning use and moments of discovery. Topped with a green roof, the drum lives as an expression of nature, sustainability, and learning. Soon after phase one is completed and opened, construction of phase two will begin. Phase two fulfills the cue, part of the formula, and will function as the center's primary performance venue. Bringing the site to completion, this final wing of the center will provide larger scale opportunities for formal performances and entertainment showcases, seating up to 250 guests. Sealed within the drum is the Great Room, a space manifest for the great coming together of people and community. Wrapped warmly by the exterior walls of meaning, screen system, this flexible space will facilitate programs and gatherings for performance, expositions, conventions, ceremonies, lectures, and more. With the guiding principles of cultivating community, education, and culture, the expanse of the Great Room is shaped to encourage and reinforce these principles. Through a blend of sculptural architecture and artful historic artifacts, the facility will be bountiful in cultural expression and community interaction. Traversing the drum from the upper level of the Great Room, one can enjoy a performance or an event below, view into the art exhibitions beyond, or simply occupy the meeting rooms and administrative spaces available on that level. Another key feature in the building's program is a secondary flexible multi-purpose space to be separate from the great room. Here, the flexible space can facilitate a variety of programs, from conference meetings and training programs, to workshops and lectures, to hosting emerging technologies for digital learning for children and adults alike, and much more. The room can even provide direct access to the green roof for expanding the classroom beyond borders. The Virginia African American Cultural Center, a place of bringing people together. Thank exciting you. plans, very exciting. Thank you, Chevette. Oh, thank you. And I hope everyone listening is exci as excited as we are to hear more from Renee. Awesome. We are going back to Renee now, and Renee is actually going to take us behind the scenes and show us some of his techniques of how he creates um, his masterpieces. And while, while we're getting set up for that, um, we do want to mention that Renee is in town for um, the Jazz Legacy Foundation's Jazz Festival, which is this weekend. Um, Alvin Kills and Jerry Horn um, do a great job of, of bringing jazz artists and jazz lovers from across the country um, to Hampton Roads to this event. So we are going to um, give you information because Renee will um, be at the Jazz Festival and um, he will be signing autographs. And, and now we are uh, going to be um, treated. We're going to be treated to watching Renee actually um, create a masterpiece and you will actually have an opportunity to bid on that masterpiece and have it in your personal collection. Hello again, Renee. Well, hello there. And uh, what I have in front of me, the painting that's in front of me here, the, the title of it is While My Guitar Gently Weeps. It's uh, 
The actual title comes from a song by George Harrison of the Beatles, one of my favorite groups. And uh, I just wanted to capture this guitarist under the spotlight. Now, the technique here is very kind of abstract. I started painting like this in 2014 with the lines. Uh, this is where I said earlier, I found my voice as an artist uh, by painting this way. And you'll notice that there are quite a number of lines and swirls, very abstract. But what I want to show is uh, how I arrive at my lines here. And I'll give you an example. In this particular area, what I do is I, I just uh, apply color, freely applying color. And then I start painting my lines. So I'll have a number of lines going. And we'll just mention while you're painting, Renee, that um, this is not the painting that's going to be up for bidding. We'll show you that later. Um, Renee just wants to share some of his techniques on this specific painting. So this, this particular uh, pattern, you'll notice that it's throughout my work. I, I work this, this pattern throughout the works. And it's part of my signature style. I'll, I'll include this in my skin tones, clothing, uh, whatever I'm painting. It's kind of a recognizable pattern that I will uh, include in the works. This is not. So are those signatures that um, collectors can immediately identify a, Re a Renee Dickerson work? Exactly. These are these are uh, colors. And one of the things, beauty about a, a acrylic painting, it dries so fast. So I can I can complete a, a painting many times in a day, or based on the size of the painting. I can complete a painting in a week or what have you. There's one painting that uh, I hope that Seiko has the uh, image of it. But that kind of gives you an idea of the lines. And then what I do after after I get that's that's applying uh, the black paint here. And so I call this white striping. And this is a, a technique that kind of looks a little simple, but if, if you can imagine painting these lines on a regular basis there. So do you paint as you receive a commission or a customer, or do you get up and paint and just you have a, um, a house full of, of your artwork? Well, I don't have a house full. In fact, uh, what happens is uh, I, I, I sell a lot of work. Uh, painting for five galleries, I'm un unable to keep up with the demand, and especially with the technique with all of these different lines and stuff. But what I do is I have uh, limited editions and open edition prints that I that I sell. In, in terms of uh, commissions, I do commissions. I, I do, but also I just create. I, I have sketches, I call them studies that um, over the years that I've created and some of them were from different styles that I had. But now I'm incorporating those studies in this new style and it's working. And I do all kinds of subjects. Now, these are mostly figurative. 
uh, works and there's a lot of musician or musical pieces because music music sells music uh, sure. is one of the most popular types but i also paint animals i paint chairs i paint trees i you know i still life i love it all and i like to work really large uh, i mean i i like the larger the better for me and a lot of the collectors that are collecting my work they have these big homes with these huge walls and some of the paintings they look like stamps on the wall so the bigger the better for me but, nice uh, as you can see the technique uh this is basically the white striping of it that is stunning can you talk a little renee about um why you're in town this week and your work with um, Alvin Kills and um, the Jazz Legacy Foundation? Yes, uh, for the last uh, five years, I've been working with uh, Jazz Legacy Foundation and uh, of course they raise uh, money for uh, the school systems here in Virginia, I believe it's Virginia Beach, Hampton and Norfolk for the music program instruments and, and the music, uh, I guess it's the music classes. Pardon me, that was uh, my, my mistake. I kind of kicked it there, so bear with me. No, we can and still the, hear you uh, and see you. But for the music program here in, um, here in uh, Virginia Beach, Hampton and uh, Norfolk, uh, the Jazz Legacy Foundation, uh, we, basically have a, a little marriage here for the last five years. Uh, I've been creating cover designs for their t-shirts and their programs and stuff. And, and uh, it's just been uh, an opportunity for me not only to contribute because all of the artwork that I do for the Jazz Legacy, I donate that art. I haven't charged them uh, not one penny for the work, but it has also given me a voice, an opportunity, exposure here in this area. And as a result of that, uh, got a lot of collectors in the area and uh, just happy to be. In fact, uh, next year, we didn't have the show last year because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, next year, I believe, is their 10th year anniversary. And we're, we have something really special uh, because it's a music program for the children. The design for the kid, well, for the uh, program next year, is going to, in fact, be the subject is going to be children. So I'm going to have the children in kind of a jazzy setting, playing instruments and that sort of, sort of thing, having fun. So that's the plan for next year. But it's been a, a, a great uh, opportunity for me. And uh, I hope that I've made a difference uh, in the area here. With Jazz we, Legacy Foundation. We thank you. And we thank do, you. we will have that information up. Renee will actually be at the Jazz Legacy um, Jazz Concerts this week. And you can actually attend and you can meet Renee and you can buy some of the artwork um, and some of the t shirts. So if you would like to meet Renee, um, you can meet him this weekend at the um, Jazz Legacy Foundation Jazz Concerts. So we will definitely have that information up for you. Renee, do you have the picture, um, the Aretha picture? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to show that piece. Uh, okay, that is the piece. Um, Go ahead, I'm sorry. The Aretha artwork is the artwork that we will auction off this month and you have an opportunity to bid and you can have this artwork in your home. And Renee is going to actually do some finishing touches to that piece. Again, if you have questions for Renee, please put them in the comments and he will answer them in real time. And this is an art piece that Renee is working on just for VAACC and our audience. So we are really excited to be able to um, share this with you all and have you bid on it this evening and the rest of the month. So Renee is actually getting ready to um, do more work with 
the Aretha piece and our um, Virginia African American Cultural Center sponsors, um, bronze sponsors, the Chrysler Museum of Art. And they can be found at www.chrysler.org, 757-664-6200. And Renee is now um, ready to show us the artwork that um, one of our audience members will um, be the winning bid on. Walk us through, are you doing some final touches or finishing to this? Can someone turn Renee's mic on? Yeah, because I had it framed. Yes. I've already completed it. I mean, it's ready. It's It's been hand embellished. Uh, one of the things with this particular piece, if I were to try to embellish it now, I think that because of where we are, I wouldn't be able to really give it justice. So I, what I did is I did the hand embellishing I took it to my framer and had it framed. It's beautifully framed. It's but gorgeous. What it is, it is, uh, the name of the piece is Tribute to the Queen. And it was commissioned, the original was commissioned by a judge up in New York City. Um, and But it's the various stages of Aretha Franklin's career. And in doing research on this particular painting, I noticed that uh, she had a, a, a very tragic history. However, I wanted to capture what we uh, enjoyed with Aretha Franklin, and that was her music. And these are the various uh, stages of her, her life. She's just a gorgeous uh, young lady and uh, contributed so much to our lives. And so I'm sure that whoever would uh, uh, bid on this and, and, and have it, they, they would really enjoy uh, this, uh, this particular uh, image of Aretha Franklin. Again, there are six different stages of her life and it yes. captures the zenith of her life, what we remember about Aretha Franklin. Sure, Renee, can you show us some of the other pictures? Um, that picture is stunning. Again, it's, com I, I'm always just spellbound at your artwork because the detail, it's like um, you envision things that are just, it just, it just magnifies your gift. And we thank you um, for sharing them with us. And we're getting some comments. Um, do you paint family portraits? That's a question from Kevin Jones. Do you paint family portraits? Actually, um, I do paint uh, family portraits. I'll tell you, my portraits, uh, I like to do something different. Uh, you know, the traditional portrait with the uh, person uh, kind of with an atmosphere around. What I would like to do is to paint uh, the subjects in a setting that is different, you know, than the traditional portrait. So if you have a favorite location, if you've been on, uh, I have this one uh, couple that collects my work. And so they travel all over the world. So what we've done with them is mm -hmm. we have them in different settings. They might be in Paris. And so we'll have incorporate some of those different things within the portrait. And I find that that's not the traditional portrait, and I like that. Uh, I like that kind of uh, uh, setting, as opposed to you know just having the atmosphere in the back. I hope that answered your question. Yes, Renee. What motivates you uh, every day? You get up and you create um, masterpieces. What motivates you? It's the. It's the uh, the love of, of, of making art. My father wanted me to be an artist. And um, as a result of that, uh, and, and then I just enjoyed it. And being, you know, being able to be successful as an artist, I'm, I'm successful. And here's something that's very important. 
uh, being successful as an artist is not always about a bank account. Uh, for me, I'm successful because I started out uh, years ago, over 50 years ago doing this, even when people told me that this wasn't going to work, I needed a real job. For me, again, that was negative motivation. It just motivated me. And now my art has gotten me into so many different uh, arenas and I'm just having fun with it. I mean, you know, uh, more than 50 years of making art and the sky is the limit. I mean, it's still, I, I, I like to tell this story that my last stroke or, or my last painting might be just a big swash across the canvas when I keel over, but I'm gonna paint until I can't paint anymore. And, and uh, uh, just enjoying every single mo moment of it. And then the creative process. Also, um, making art is problem solving. Sometimes I'm working on five or six paintings at a time. Um, there's a painting here I, I, I want to share with you. This one is uh, it's called uh, Sax Appeal. And it's an unfinished piece. But what I use on, on my instruments, this is a 23 karat gold leaf that I use on the instruments. And it'll always stay bright. But always it's... Uh, experimenting, uh, problem solving. Sometimes uh, it's color, sometimes it's composition. I'm stumped in one area. I'll start working on another piece. And then uh, I figure out how to finish another piece based on color composition or uh, some other aspect of the painting. There's uh, one other, uh, a, a couple of pieces I want to, uh, Seiko, if you can find please. it. Uh, yeah, go ahead, it. please. And while you're getting getting that ready, Renee, how does one, if they appreciate art and they want to start collecting art, how do they get started? And more importantly, if they feel they're on um, a budget, is there a way to to start? I think that um, the best. I, I think that this is the best advice. Anybody could collect art. I mean, I mean, here we live in this country. This is America, and uh, while uh, art could have high prices, but I think that one thing is you find something that you like, uh, a style, an artist, what have you. And if you can meet that artist and make friends with the artist, and buy directly from the artist and not go through the galleries. And the galleries are going to be upset with me by saying this. But if you can get directly to the artist, we just love to have you have some of our work in your home. I mean, but there are open editions. There are limited editions. There are original works that could be purchased. And then there are commissions. And um, I think it's important, uh, especially with me, I can speak for myself. I'm willing to work within a budget of whatever. I, I, you know, it's not, for me, it's not all about the money. It's, it's not. Uh, I think that uh, I'm willing to work within a person's uh, uh, boundaries. So just having them to own some of my work and, I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm proud that uh, ones would be interested in this. Now, this next piece, I'd like to, uh, I think we have it ready. Yeah. Uh, this was a fun piece. Um, I was doing a show in Washington, D.C., and this was the, uh, I guess, was the last year of uh, Obama's presidency. And um, they had the Black Caucus uh, going on in D.C., as well as at that time, speaking of museums, the African American Museum was just getting ready to open. So there was this traveling show, the uh, um, Harlem Fine Art Show, and they wanted me to be a part of it. So they gave me a booth, and we were going to be there for four days. And so I wanted to do a portrait. I call these portraits in Rene Vision. And so Obama was very popular, very noticeable, every, I mean, very identifiable. And so this particular uh, painting, I started 
uh, we were going to be four days. And so I did this particular, uh, this was one of, I actually did 44 of these paintings. If you look really closely to this painting, the 44 is hidden in the painting. It's really big. And when you find it and you see it. I'm looking, I'm, tr <laughs> I'm trying to find it. It, it's it's really big. I'll tell you this, it's as large as his head. And when you see it, it's like, oh yeah, I see it, you know? Oh, this is and, amazing. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, but this particular piece, uh, uh, when I first started doing this, uh, I was painting them, I, I started it that week and I wanted to do a portrait of uh, Obama because he was recognizable as I mentioned, but this is portraits I call this one uh, Obama and Renee Bish. Gorgeous. Again, Renee, how can people reach you if they would like to see more of your art or commission um, an artwork? How can they reach you? Well, if they'd like to get in contact with me directly, I do have a website, ReneeDickerson.com. And also my phone number, 703-850-8804. And I answer all calls. Now, sometimes, you know, you get the robocall, but I answer the robocalls, I, you know, and, and if, if I don't answer right away, it's because I'm busy. Sure. But I definitely will return the calls. And um, I'm hoping to... Uh, invite ones to uh, an open studio. That's a that's another way that if you can find an artist and have open go to the open studio, it's it's a good uh, way to collect the artwork from from the artist. Sometimes you can go by and you can find some of that uh, work that the artist really doesn't want anybody to see or he's not really comfortable with. And then uh, perhaps he'll let you have it for a little or nothing. I, I thank you so much for this time. And we are also going to put up the jazzlegacyfoundation.org website. That's how you can find information about um, the jazz festival that's coming up this week. And Renee will be there. So you will have an opportunity to meet him and purchase some of his art. And we also on um, the VAA CC website, we will have information on, on how to bid on that beautiful Aretha Franklin art. Um, this has definitely been a treat, Renee. Thank you for sharing um, your behind the scenes um, with us. What final um, information would you give or tips to not only artists, but just people in general who have a passion and what would you say to them to keep them motivated to getting to where they feel that they're successful? Well, you know, I, I think that it's, it's very important um, to, as I mentioned earlier, to know that we have something to bring to the table. And we all know what it is, uh, whether it's, you know, behind the camera, whether it's musical, whether it's literary, whether it's an artist, or whether mm -hmm. it's a musician, whatever, um, whether it's an architect or a designer of clothes, anything uh, that we aspire to, do your best and know that we can always improve. The biggest room in any house is room for improvement. And if we think in that terms and know that we don't have to compete with the next guy, except for, I was saying this, in, except for in sports, <laughs> you got number one team. You want to be number one there. But really uh, know that you have something to offer. And this is very important, these words. Being honest. Um, I say this all the time, the softest pillow is a clear conscience. You go through life knowing that you're giving your best and you're not trying to take advantage of people. 
but you're there to give your best on all occasions. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like a repeat customer. Yes. <laughs> and people who just really enjoy being around you. So giving your best is so very important. Well, thank you again. And uh, we have a audience member, viewer, Ellen Lindsay commented, that's why you have been so successful, Mr. Dickerson, because you are so humble. Well, I tell you, um, you know, when you think about humility, there is no one that can compare to our creator. He humbly condescends to deal with us lowly humans. So we're encouraged to be imitators of God. And so as a result of that, you know, we can just, uh, we can just grow. We can grow and uh, have something to contribute to this short time that we have living on this planet. Absolutely. Renee, it has been an honor to spend this evening with you and learn about you and your craft. And we can't thank you enough for sharing with us this evening. Thank you so much. Can I add one more thing? Uh, yes. I do have, um, if you were to Google Renee Dickerson, a retrospective, uh, then there is a, uh, it's 50 years, and you can see some of my early works and where I am now. A, a retrospect, Renee Dickerson, a retrospective. Okay, Google Renee Dickerson, me. a retrospective. Is that a video form? Yeah, it's in video form and you can, you'll can you find it on YouTube. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for this opportunity to um, share your insights and your wisdom and, and your genius and your artistic um, masterpieces with us. Thank you so much. And, on behalf of the Virginia African American Cultural Center, I will reintroduce Chevette Jones, board member, and she will have closing remarks. Wow, I know that is such a small word for such a big presentation, but I think this sums up the evenings. Uh, Renee's talents are seemingly uh, without limits. As you have seen this evening with this incredible works that have been shared throughout the presentation, um, and I know that many of you also are wondering how you can own a piece of Renee's artwork. Didi has shared with you that you can uh, find him this week at uh, the Jazz Legacy concert. You can also find him uh, online. Uh, he also produced his phone number. We also know that many of you read that you may win Yes, when this tribute to Aretha Franklin, the queen of song that Renee donated to the Virginia African American Cultural Center. On November 12th, a link to our silent auction will be emailed and placed on our website. On December 1st, the winner will be announced, but that email will detail all of the directions and specifications for being a part of this silent auction. And then you too will be able to own one of Renee Dickerson's masterpieces. All details about the silent auction, additional information about how you can contact Renee can also be obtained by contacting us at info at VAACCVB.org. Tonight's presentation and auction items would not have been possible without the generosity of Mr. Dickerson and the talents of Ms. DDG, Mr. Seiko Varner, and Mr. Kelvin Oliver. I'd also like to thank our board members who are in attendance and our sponsor, the Chrysler Museum. The entire Masterpiece series is funded in part by the Virginia Beach Arts and Humanities Commission Community Grant. Please register to join us for another exciting evening on December 23rd with an evening with Maestro Don Pearson. If you would like to see more programs and programming like this, we invite you to support us by joining VACC and going to our website, vaccvb.org. Again, thanks for attending and have a great week. And thank you, Dee Dee. <laughs>